All right, hey, welcome back. Good to see you again. Um, so this is just our next installment as we continue through our current new topic, which is uh, all about the animal ethics debate. Um, and to a lesser extent, the environment. We talked a little bit about that in the uh, previous introductory lecture. But now we want to follow up and continue with the first author on the subject. We kind of had a nice primer and introduction to the topic. We discussed uh, the concept of moral status and how that means that a thing which has that is something that is entitled to some level of consideration and respect. Um, clearly, tissue paper over there doesn't have it, but you and I do. The question then is that whether animals, non-human animals, whether they have any moral status as well. Uh, if not, why not? If so, why? Um, and there are different views. The traditional view of the West has been that animals possess no significant moral status, uh, that they're tools that may be used by humans for whatever purposes that we see fit, and we can disregard their interests, their pleasure, their pain, um, as we make these decisions about how to use them, whether that's for food, whether that's for um, you know, uh, animal testing and experiments or clothing. When we speak about food, too, I don't want it to be misunderstood in, in the sense that it's like literally for survival. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment, but it's possible to survive on a vegetarian diet, as we all know. So it's not as if a person uh, would not be able to like literally make it, you know, through survival without the use of animal flesh. Um, so the question could still be raised whether animals have a moral status. If so, why and if not, why not? The traditional view of the West is that animals do not possess any real moral status. And uh, there are different views as to why. Some say it's because they lack a soul. Some say it's because they lack the capacity for human types of relationships. Other people say it's because they don't have uh, the ability to enter into contracts, or maybe it's because they um, are not persons or lack reason in some general way. And uh, we talked about all those factors. Uh, some of them are hard to establish in any case, like, for example, the existence of the soul. Um, others are a little bit questionable because they would seem to also rule out of the moral community uh, certain human beings that lack some of those abilities, like whether it be the mentally disabled or the very young or, or whoever. So um, we've come now to uh, also consider the concept of speciesism. Peter Singer, who we're going to follow up with now, he thinks that if we don't give equal consideration to the interests of animals in terms of their pain and suffering, at least, uh, then we would be um, not treating them equally, even though the interests that we have with the, uh, in common with them um, are being treated differently in the human case. So that speciesism, speciesism is unequal treatment on the basis that the being is of a different uh, species than you are. We don't often think of speciesism as something that is on par with these other forms of bigotry and discrimination like racism and sexism and uh, ableism. Uh, but Peter Singer does think that the argument could, could be made that um, there are significant areas where we don't treat animals the same way as we would treat a common human. And if that's unequal treatment to the other because of their different species, he thinks of this as a form of discrimination that can be morally criticized like racism in those can be. So, okay, here we go. We finally reached the point that we're going to start breaking down Peter Singer's uh, argument and his essay. So this is All Animals Are Equal by Peter Singer. Okay, that's the title of the uh, essay that we're reading here. And it comes to us from um, 1993. And um, the author's name is Peter Singer. Peter Singer was born in 1947 and he's still alive today, still active in the field. Um, <clears throat> he has taught at some elite institutions like Princeton and um, uh, and also in Australia, where he's originally from. Um, he wrote a book in the 70s that kind of became a classic. It was called Animal Liberation. And um, that book inspired a whole generation of moral philosophy on the topic of animal ethics. Um, the first chapter of that book is called All Animals Are Equal. So even though this is a 1993 version of it, it's just kind of like a slightly updated version of um, the first chapter of his, of his book. Back in the 70s when he wrote that book, there really was not that much attention being paid to the question of whether animals have rights or whether the moral treatment of animals is a problem. Uh, of course, it's become, I would say, a much larger issue and 
there's much more consciousness of that today in 2023 than there was 50 years or so ago back in the 70s when he published that. So he's known as one of the kind of, I guess, uh, pioneers of the ethical debate on this topic. And uh, we're looking at the essay, standalone essay, All Animals Are Equal from 1993. But again, it's just an adapted version of the first chapter of his uh, book called Animal Liberation, which came from the you know, from the 70s. Okay, so that's our author, dates of his life, and, um, and the title of this paper here. Okay, so all animals are equal. <clears throat> He says something that you might sound it might sound to you like almost radical at first. He says we need to recognize animals as our moral equals. We got to recognize them as our moral equals. Why? Why you might ask? Because of an important principle and this principle is like the kind of centerpiece of his entire argument here. It's known as the principle of equal consideration of interests. So the equal consideration of interests principle. <clears throat> Let me put it here, and then we'll talk about that. So, okay, so he, he offers this principle to us to contemplate, and he thinks it's just Common sense tells you that it's true. So the principle, it's called the equal consideration of interest principle, and here's what it says. That we should give equal weight to the like interests of all those affected by our actions. Okay, I'll write, I'll write that, and I'll repeat it, and then I'll explain it more. But um, we should give equal weight. To the like interests, okay, that's a term that we'll explain, to the like interests um, of all those affected by our actions. Okay. The principle of equal consideration of interests. We should give equal weight to the like interests of all those that are affected by our actions. Okay. Um, so, for example, suppose that there's um, this principle, the equal consideration principle. This is the principle that is needed to establish all forms of even just human equality. Okay. So for us to have made progress on like racial equality or gender equality or equality of members of different uh, nations or races or religions, for us to have advanced any kind of equality in these different areas, this principle had to be embraced and it had to be applied to those aspects of human life. So say, for example, that a man and a woman both go into the hospital with an exactly identical injury. They've got a painful I don't know, foot injury, like a broken foot. And um, they both walk up to the receptionist's desk, say, at the same exact time. And, um, you know, the receptionist sees the two of them, and they just notify the receptionist at the desk of the hospital, hey, I have a broken foot, says one, so says the other. It's the same injury, okay? They're both in pain to the same degree with the same injury. What if the receptionist was like, okay, I see that you guys are both here, but ma'am, would you please take a seat so I can get the gentleman first? Because we want to treat the man's foot injury before you. I understand it's the same injury, <clears throat> but uh, the pain of a man just matters a little bit more than the pain of a woman. Now, come on. Would that be fair? Obviously not. That would be a case of sexism. And if I substituted a member you know, of different two races or something, you'd get a case of racism or age. Again, we would have ageism. So notice there. What's the interest that the two individuals have? The interest in, you know, receiving um, some kind of treatment for the injury, right? They're interested in being free of that pain. And um, if you say I prioritize one over the other, then you're not giving equal weight to the same interest that they both have, right? So you're weighing the interest of the man's pain relief more heavily than the interest of the woman's pain relief. And that would be 
discriminatory treatment, which would be sexist. Okay, take a more possibly realistic case, I guess, slavery, okay? With slavery, as we know, tragically, sadly, you know, horribly, there was a time period where human beings were held as property and forced to, you know, engage in servitude to somebody uh, without any kind of compensation just to be enslaved. Now, everybody has an interest in liberty and living autonomously and free. A white person or a black person, of course, both have that same interest. But according to the original way our constitution was framed, it had said, you know, that slavery was legal and justified. And there was this amendment that said that a slave was considered three-fifths of a person for tax purposes and stuff like that. As we all know, we've moved far beyond that in terms of, you know, changing uh, our constitution and reflecting the rights that all human beings have, trying to live up to our own values and guiding ideals. But at that initial time, there was an equal interest in living free, which was respected in the case of a white person, but not respected in the case of a black person, at least in the United States and in some other countries too. So again, that was wrong, perhaps. It wasn't giving equal weight to the same interest of liberty of all those affected by what the policy would have been. Um, so anyway, for us to say that men and women should both be allowed to vote, another case, a man and a woman could have, did have, an equal interest in being able to make a civic determination as a voter about how an election should be decided. But until 1920, when the U.S. Constitution was amended, uh, women were not permitted under the law to vote in our country. So to achieve the equality that we now see, we had to recognize that where the interest is the same, the same consideration should be given to the interest. So if a man has an interest in voting and a woman, we should not say, let us honor the man's right to vote and not stand in the way of that, but block and frustrate the woman's right to the same thing because it's the same interest. So if the interests are the same, the respect and consideration of them should be the same. That's the point here. If two people are interested in being free of pain, we shouldn't say that one person's pain and interest in avoiding it matters more than the other. If two people are interested in be living free and not being living as slaves, uh, that we shouldn't say, well, we only respect and consider the interest of the one type of person not to live as a slave, but not the other type of person, or whether it be man, woman, white, black, and et cetera. Uh, if it was religion, you know, suppose that we said, well, um, Christian people, they get the, these rights. We're going to create the second class citizen status for Jewish people. You know, in fact, that situation did exist in a lot of the um, early Christian and medieval period in Europe and other places with respect to Jewish people. But anyway, um, that would be unequal treatment too, because it would be disrespect of, well, it would be non-equal treatment of the same interest just because someone's from a different, uh, in that case, case, religion. So we already seem to understand in some general way that this principle holds good when it comes to the way we should treat each other as humans. Uh, that when two human beings have the same interest, and that's the only factor being considered, that we should not show greater favor to one or the other, that they should be given equal weight. We should give equal interest, or sorry, equal consideration to the same interests if two beings have the same interest. Interest meaning they want something or that they're, you know, uh, they find it of value. So we should give equal weight to the like interests of all those affected by our actions. If two people are in the same pain, we should give the same respect uh, to their desire to be free regarding it. On page 577, rather, the author says this. Um, if a being suffers, there can be no moral justification for refusing to take that suffering into consideration. So the principle of equal consideration of interests acts like a pair of scales, weighing interests impartially, with no bias. True scales favor the side where the interest is stronger or where several interests combine to outweigh a smaller number of similar interests but they take no account of whose interests they are weighing, okay? So it doesn't matter whether the person's a man or woman. The only thing that matters is the nature of the interest they have, let's say, in avoiding pain in the one example. The particularities of whether a person's white or black don't matter. It's just whether they have an interest in avoiding being held uh, in bondage and servitude. Um, so that principle, he says, is something that we have some idea of and that we already kind of recognize and apply to our social world among humans. In other words, it would not make sense to say with respect to humans, my pain matters and you should not hurt me, but your pain does not matter and it's okay for me to hurt you. If we both have an interest in avoiding pain, 
then we can't say that one of our interests had, has more uh, value than the other. So equality of interests is what he says establishes equal treatment, um, at least with respect to that interest. But equality of interest is not the same thing as having exactly equal rights. Um, because animals, after all, they, well, when we're, let's consider how this is going to ultimately then be applied to the issue of animals, which is our current topic. So again, um, animals have an interest in living a pain-free life, just like you and me. With a human being, we don't generally cause pain to other humans unless it's absolutely necessary for like self-defense. Um, but we don't just wantonly hurt other human beings because we respect their desire to be free from pain. On the other hand, we make use of uh, animal agriculture, food and um, products tested on animals that causes them significant amounts of pain and suffering, which we would never accept if it was a human being put through the same experience. Um, so we should show, he thinks, equal consideration of the animal's interest in being free of pain and suffering, because that interest at least is one that we share in common with them. So whether it's a human or say a pig or a cow, that's interested in not suffering. He does not see why we would weigh those interests differently. If it's the animal's interest or the human's interest in avoiding pain and suffering, then if that's something we, we decline to do to a human, we should also decline to do it to a similar animal. Um, so it's all about equality of treatment with respect to the same interests. The relevant interest that is common between humans and animals is the interest to in avoiding pain and suffering. So at least on that one alone, uh, we should show the same kind of regard and considerate treatment to animals' interest in avoiding pain and suffering as we already showed to other human beings with respect to our dealings with humans. Um, now, equal treatment about equal interests does not establish equal rights, okay? Um, why not? Well, because animals don't have an interest in everything that humans can have interest in. This might remind you and take you back a little bit to the ideas of Michael Tooley that we studied on the abortion topic. He said that in order to have a right to something, a being must be able to have an interest in that same thing. And that's why he said that the fetus lacks the right to life because it's not yet capable of contemplating its non-existence. So it cannot yet formulate thought uh, that it, can, it desires to continue the existence. Um, so... Um, with the principle of equal consideration of interests, it shows that if we have an interest that is the same as an animal's, then we should weigh them the same. Um, and the relevant interest that is the same is the interest in avoiding pain. So let me put that point here clearly. <clears throat> One interest that we share with animals. So notice that when I wrote up the statement of the equal consideration of interest principle. It said, uh, we should give equal weight to the like interests of all those affected by our actions. What does like interest mean? That means that they have to be alike. They have to be the same type of interest or the same interest. So if we have an interest that's the same, or let's, let me put it this way, if animals have any interests that are the same as ours, then we should show the exact same level of respect and concern for those interests as we would show to a human that expressed them. What's the interest that we share with animals? Well, one of them is this, uh, the interest in avoiding pain and suffering. The interest in avoiding pain. So, have you noticed that you don't want to experience pain? <laughs> I mean, it's an obvious fact, uh, almost something that's too straightforward to mention, but we got to be clear. None of us wants to feel pain. None of us wants to suffer. Um, so we try to avoid pain in all ways. If we think something's going to hurt us, we try to get away from that thing. And no nobody wants to be exposed to pain if they could possibly avoid it. So uh, from my point of view and from your point of view as humans, we have every interest in avoiding that experience of pain and suffering. It's not nice, almost by definition. I mean, it's pain. We don't want that. Um, but animals also have an interest in avoiding pain and suffering. You don't have to be a, a sophisticated human being. You don't have to be Einstein or Sir Isaac Newton or 
you know, uh, anybody of distinction to know that pain is bad. Uh, you can also simply be uh, a, an animal. An animal wants to avoid pain too. Notice the behavior of animals when something painful is in their environment. They try to run away from it, avoid it. If they're hurt by something, if a painful stimuli is given to them, then they recoil away, they wince in pain, they don't seek it out, so they show aversive behavior to painful stimuli. Therefore, their behavior is exactly identical to human behavior when something painful is um, in the environment. They don't want to feel pain. They are interested in avoiding it. Same as us. We want to avoid pain. So do they. It's the same interest. It's a like interest. So um, this principle of equality of interest says that uh, we can't just limit that principle to humans. We regard discrimination against people as totally wrong. Racism is wrong. Sexism is wrong, right? Discrimination amongst human communities, we think it's wrong. Many people don't think that that same equality of treatment applies to animals, but Singer thinks that's prejudicial against the interests of the animals, and it's a form of speciesism which he sees as somewhat parallel to racism. He thinks we have to challenge ourselves, grapple with our own biases, um, because our concern with these other non-human animals, it should not depend on what they're like or what abilities they have. It should not depend on whether they can talk or write or um, read philosophy or, you know, um, post a video to YouTube or to use the internet. It shouldn't depend on those things. Um, that's why he says arbitrary differences shouldn't make a difference to human treatment. We don't think that the difference of skin color is a fair enough reason to say that some people shouldn't be treated equally to other human people. Um, and he says the same is true of level of intelligence. We don't say that somebody who's mentally disabled doesn't have human rights in the same way that somebody who's fully cognitively functional has rights. We think that it doesn't change it at all um, whether those two individuals have moral standing. And so Peter Singer thinks that the same fact should be recognized with respect to the difference of species. Just because of beings of a different species, what difference does that have to make about how bad it is to feel pain? What difference does that have to make about how much any living thing wants to avoid suffering and experiencing pain? So um, he says if we want to really treat other living things equally, and we want to live up according to a, a moral principle that he thinks is deeply rooted in our own mm, conscience, then we should treat the same interests with the same respect. We should treat animals' interest in avoiding pain and suffering parallel and equal to the human interest in avoiding pain and suffering. But notice that this, again, does not establish exactly equal rights. He's not saying that we should give animals the right to vote or the right to freedom of speech or practice religion or to marry the partner of their choice because those are things animals don't have interest in because they're not cognitively aware of those things. So where there's no similar interest, the principle doesn't apply. It's not that we have to give them equal consideration with respect to their desire to vote, as I was mentioning before in the human case, because they don't have an interest in voting. But a man and a woman can both have that same interest, so they should be given the same recognition with respect to that interest. Where no equal interests exist, no principle of equal consideration pertains. But where there's a similar interest, the principle says you should treat it exactly alike. So with animals, even if we don't say there's all these other things that we have in common, interest in books, interest in you know voting or religion, or whatever, we can all say we agree that there's an interest in avoiding pain and suffering. So that one alone, he says, if we acted to respect in equal measure the human and the animal uh, interest in avoiding that, then we'd have to really radically reform a lot of our practices to avoid being these speciesists who don't give equal consideration only because the being's a different species than you are. So what's the relevant attribute? It's this ability to feel pain and suffering. That's what he thinks gives animals moral status and moral standing. It's not the things that were mentioned in the previous lecture, whether they would have a soul, whether they could have complicated uh, relationships, or whether they could uh, understand contracts or um, reason or use language. It's just whether they can suffer and feel pain. He quotes um, another philosopher who came from a couple centuries before. This is Jeremy Bentham, one of the original founders, actually, of utilitarianism, one of the major ethical theories that we studied before. I'll just type his name here in this uh, typed chat just briefly, but it's Jeremy Bentham. Um, let me see if I can get his dates just because it's convenient enough to have that here on record. 
I think it's like 1748 until a certain time period that I'll get the right fact. Yeah, it is 1748 to 1832. Okay, so just so we know his dates, I'll put that also in the chat. <clears throat> So Jeremy Bentham, one of the other kind of like founding father figures of the utilitarian ethical system, along with John Stuart Mill, who's the primary guy we focused on. But anyway, Bentham, a British philosopher of his time, he was kind of ahead of his time when he talked about animals and animal ethics. And he has this quote that uh, Peter Singer, the current author, cites. And he uses this quotation to kind of give a sense of his perspective on why animals have moral standing. So he writes it here. This is him quoting Bentham. Bentham wrote, the day may come when the rest of the animal creation may acquire the rights which never could have been withheld from them except by the hand of tyranny. The French have already discovered that the blackness of skin is no reason why a human being should be abandoned to the caprice of a tormentor. If one, it, it may one day come to be recognized that the number of legs, the texture of the skin, uh, etc. Are, are reasons equally insufficient for abandoning a sensitive being to the same fate. <clears throat> what else is it that should trace the line? Is it the faculty of reason or perhaps the faculty of discourse? But a full-grown horse or dog is beyond comparison a more rational as well as a more conversable animal than an infant of a day or week or even a month old. But suppose they weren't, what would it matter? The question is not can they reason nor can they talk, but can they suffer? Okay, so that last phrase I want you to focus on. He's referring to Bentham here because Bentham said the only real moral question that matters when it comes to these animals is not whether they can talk, whether they can do a crossword puzzle. It's can they suffer? If they can suffer, then there's no moral basis for denying recognition of that suffering as you decide how to interact with those beings. So can they suffer? He says that's the baseline question, and the answer is simply yes. Um, but notice that ability to suffer is not just any other random attribute of something, like its weight or its color. Uh, the ability that a thing has to suffer is what makes it even eligible to have any interests. Because if a thing could not suffer, like a plant or whatever, then you wouldn't worry at all about actions taken to it that could cause it suffering, because it simply couldn't. Once a thing can suffer, though, it can have interests, like the interest in avoiding that suffering and pain. <clears throat> So it's a basic precondition for having any interests, and therefore it seems to be a fundamental prerequisite for even having rights. It's what distinguishes sentient creatures from all the inanimate objects of the world. Um, so sentient means that you're sensitive to things, you can feel things, you can experience and perceive things, including pain and pleasure. So if something can suffer, if a sentient being like a human or an animal can suffer, he says there's no justification for refusing to acknowledge that suffering and to take it into consideration. The principle of equal consideration of interest says that that interest must be respected the same in an animal as it is in a person. So when he says we should recognize animals as our moral equals, <clears throat> that's not to be said as like, we'll let them vote and we'll let them, you know, um, you know, practice their own religion. Obviously, again, those rights and treatments don't apply because they have no interest in those. But when the interests overlap with ours, like an overlapping segment of a Venn diagram, then those same interests should be accorded the same recognition and respect. And he highlights the particular similar interest we have with the animals in avoiding pain and suffering. So um, say that a person was a racist, they would violate the equal consideration principle by giving greater weight to members of their own race or sexism be doing the same with respect to sex. Speciesists do the same with respect to members of their own species. They say pain in the animal, I don't care about it morally, and I'm not going to consider it or give it respect. But pain in a human like myself, I will, you know, recognize that I have an obligation not to cause it any such pain. So you know how like if a person's a racist, they're going to show a preference for members of their own group, discriminating against members of the out group, and the basis for in-group, out-group distinctions is racial differences. With speciesism, you show favorable treatment to members of your group, unequal treatment to members of an out-group, except now the in-out-group distinction is determined on the basis of species membership rather than racial identification. Um, now, what about the pain of humans as compared to the pain of animals? Some people might think that the human pain of uh, uh, that uh, animals and human pains compared 
um, makes human pain worse. Some people think that because they would say, well, because we're more intelligent, <clears throat> we can know what's happening to us. So, okay, like here, let me give you an analogy. Take an animal living on a factory farm that's just going to be slaughtered and used for meat. And until that happens, it's living in a pretty difficult, caged, cramped environment where it's miserable and painful throughout the duration of its short life. So it's got a miserable life living in these crates and boxes until it's finally processed for slaughter and then eaten by a human. <coughs> okay, not a great way to live, painful, full of suffering. Okay, on the other hand, let's say like a human being is in a concentration camp in some terrible, you know, fascist regime and they're going to be executed at the end of some like period of forced labor that they have to endure where they're just being brutalized and made weak. Um, if you compare the human that's living in a similar case to the animal here that we're comparing two cases of, <clears throat> you could argue that it's the human that's going to suffer more because they're aware of uh, what's happening and they can anticipate with dread what's coming next. Like they can say, oh God, they're just going to kill me in the end. So this is all for nothing. And it's really just a horrible thing that I have to think about those facts. Plus they can understand that they're going to die and they can contemplate their own mortality and be afraid of the loss of their life. But the animal it doesn't have the same higher order awareness of the full like logistics of the situation. So we cannot like rationalize or say, well, I'm at a factory, which is going to slaughter me in the end. Um, so it doesn't maybe have that same kind of dread that's anticipating the bad outcome at the end. It's just in the moment um, without language and without communication to guide it through. Um, it might be lacking in certain awareness that could make the human experience more terrifying because they'd be fully aware of all the details of the complex situation they're in. So could human pain be worse because it comes with this higher intellectual factor of like say dread and anticipatory dread and things like that. Well, Singer says maybe that's occasionally true, but he doesn't want to really concede the point that human is worse pain than animal pain. If you just compare them pound for pound um, to illustrate, he says sometimes, um, the animals can suffer more because of their lack of full awareness of their situation. So we could just as well flip the intuition around. Um, is it really more or less troubling to be in a situation where you don't know what's li liable to happen next and you don't even know whether the suffering could go on for eternity? You know, an animal doesn't have this knowledge of its finite lifespan, and it also doesn't fully comprehend the point that it's being put to through all these factory farm processes. So it can't say things like a human could say to themselves to somehow console themselves. Like, well, I know it's painful, but it'll end soon. Or I understand that I'm going to be put to death at the end. So if I can just endure this, at least then I will be free of pain. The animal, for all it knows, is going to be in this persistent situation forever. So the situation of panic, fear, and anxiety of not even understanding what's happening could actually make their situation more dreadful and uh, you know, mentally painful as well as physically painful. So he says these factors kind of cancel out. Anticipatory dread on the side of the human might make their pain worse, but lack of awareness and insight on behalf of the animal might make their pain and suffering worse. So he says no clear view dominates. Therefore, we should just suppose that animal pain is in all relevant respects much similar to the sort of human pain that we feel a general obligation not to cause without exceptionally good reason. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and furthermore, I mean, even if... Um, you know, we thought that animals don't have the full awareness of their situation, making their pain like less severe. That doesn't give anyone the moral argument that we should make uh, medical experiments or used for organ harvesting, like mentally disabled humans, which could also lack the same kind of uh, future oriented desires and awareness. So, um, so on all these different grounds, he says, let's just keep it back to the basis that he gives, which is the equal consideration principle. We've identified a common interest between us and the animals, and now he just hones in on how uh, we should treat that interest in avoiding pain and suffering that animals have equivalently to the way we would treat it in the, in the person of any human being that has the same interest. Okay, so speciesism in practice. That's the next section of his essay. The next section of his essay is when he's going to try and lay out for the reader in what areas of life do we as humans uh, act as speciesists? Like in what cases do we treat animals differently than ourselves only because they are not members of the same species? Well, he has a few where areas there. So um, how are we 
species is in practice. In practice, meaning like, you know, in our regular lives, what do we do, if anything, that, that constitutes being speciesist? Okay, well, here's one of them. Um, using animals as food. Okay, using animals as food, that would be one of the maybe primary areas where we do actually seem to be, at least according to his way of defining the term, speciesist. Okay, so some of us have pets, some of us don't, but uh, a lot of people, the big majority, consumes animal products of one kind or another. Um, talking about eating meat. And uh, that means that whether you have a pet or not, you're coming into contact with animals at pretty regular intervals. Unless you're a vegetarian or vegan, you're making contact with these animals indirectly at least. Well, I don't know if it's, in, it's a direct contact. You're indirectly related to their death, their slaughter and the factory farm conditions that they live on prior to that because we're, you know, contacting them at mealtime as meals. That's a very basic form of animal use, and uh, you could argue exploitation. It's using the animal, its life, its flesh, its muscle tissue, uh, for the sake of the pleasures of the palate, for the sake of the enjoyment of tasting the animal's uh, meat. But if their interest in avoiding pain and suffering <coughs> requires respect equal to that of a human, and then he does not think that we can justify the carnivorous diet, the diet that includes animals in it. That food, the animal products, it's not necessary for health or longevity. So eating that meat, as he argues, involves balancing these two things. A minor human trivial interest in the pleasures of palate, like taste and preference. And we're measuring that against the lives, the welfare, and the pain and suffering of the animals. So that is... Sacrificing major interests, being free of pain and suffering, the major interests, sacrificing that for minor interests, getting the couple of moments of uh, sensory pleasure that comes from enjoying the taste of these animal products. So, okay, um, a couple of points. Why is that speciesist? Or maybe I'll, um, I'll just put it down. <clears throat> This is species is because um, <clears throat> meat is not necessary. Meat and just other animal products. So maybe I'll just make that even more specific. Meat slash animal products. Because it's not just meat, but there's also, you know, milk and um, uh, other things derived from animals that are not the, the flesh itself. This is species because, um, like eggs, meat and animal products. Um, are not necessary for health or longevity. So that means it's not necessary. Like you don't need to use meat or consume animal products in order to like literally stay alive or to be healthy. A person can live a healthy long life. And you know, according to some uh, people's arguments and some dietary um, theories, you might actually live a healthier and longer life if you avoid eating meat. You know, vegetarians in some cases do very well comparatively when you see the um, outcomes health-wise in the long term. So um, that means that in order to use animals as food, you can't say I'm doing this in order to survive because otherwise I would not survive. All you're saying is I'm doing this because I enjoy the flavor. I enjoy the taste. I enjoy this kind of palate preference or meal option. Um, but what that means is that you're sacrificing, again, the animal's well-being against your desire for this momentary palate preference. And the equal consideration principle, and just utilitarianism in general, it doesn't permit us to sacrifice major utility for minor utility. So if we count the pain and pleasures of the animals on par with our own, then this would be like imposing severe pain and suffering and ending life in order to derive what in exchange? Uh, a couple of moments of enjoyable food, um, which is not even essential for a person's health or longevity. It seems that that would be um, you know, not at all showing the same level of consideration and respect for the animal's interest in avoiding pain and suffering as we would with a human. Because with a human, again, even if a human was the most delicious thing you could ever eat, um, setting aside the fact that uh, you know 
you might be kind of grossed out by the thought of cannibalism, but you know, take another human, take another species like this alien hypotheticals. They come down to Earth. They're they're like us in the sense that we can communicate and we're all um, rational and intelligent and we can just converse. Uh, but would you really be comfortable eating them just because they're non-humans, um, even if they were the most delicious things ever? It would seem that where the interests are the same, uh, the uh, recognition and consideration should be the same. And I don't know if the alien hypothetical is actually helpful here because it's not necessary when we're talking about animals. We consider these animals to be non-rational, okay? And of course, they aren't rational in the same way as we are because they can't talk, write, know about history or science or chemistry or astronomy or any other number of fields, right? But um, they can suffer and they can feel pain. They want to avoid that pain and suffering. So the author is just asking you to sort of be willing to grant the same level of consideration for avoiding pain and averting pain in the animal as in a human, because the interest is the same, so it should be given the same treatment. Um, now, it's not just also, with respect to the concept of animals being used as food, it's not just their death um, that is part of the moral problem, but it's also all the suffering that they have to endure to get to um, the level of being consumed on the marketplace as meat. You know, it's not like these animals in factory farms are treated very well prior to being used as meat. Um, <clears throat> because of the sort of capitalist um, imperatives, which imply generating as much animal products at the lowest cost to the consumer, right? Because we demand abundantly available and ever cheaper um, consumer supply of meat and animal products. So that means that these big animal agricultural producers, they have to make more efficient and streamline the production of meat, which means that they have to afford the animals less and less space, um, reduce the time scales more and more so that the production of them can be increased. Um, so you have to always make these sacrifices to the animal's welfare and, um, and well-being in order to compress the time frame and maximize the efficient output of animal products. So like the more chickens you can fit in a cage, uh, the better for the chicken producer. The more cows that can all be crammed into one compressed feedlot, the better it might be for uh, the dairy producer or for the beef producer. Um, and same with pigs and other things too. So there are very brutal factory farming productions that are used on these animals. Um, and he says that if we really cared that much about treating their desire for avoiding pain and suffering equally to ours, then we couldn't possibly justify a diet that made use of these factory farmed animal products. To get a sense of some of the other brutal um, factory farm practices that animals are exposed to in those environments, we read here on page 582. Um, apart from taking their lives, there are also many other things done to animals in order to bring them cheaply to our dinner table. Castration with no anesthetic, uh, the separation of mother and young, the breaking up of herds, branding, transporting, and of course the moments of slaughter. All of these are likely to involve suffering and do not take the animal's interests into account. Perhaps animals could be raised on a small scale without suffering in these ways, but it does not seem economical or practical to do so on the scale needed to feed large urban populations. In any case, the important question is not whether animal flesh could be produced without suffering, but whether the flesh we are considering buying was produced without suffering. Unless we can be confident that it was, the principle of equal consideration of interests implies that it was wrong to sacrifice important interests of the animals um, uh, in order to satisfy less important interests of our own. Consequently, we should boycott the, the, the end result of this process. Okay, let me make a couple points about what he's just said there. He has said that... Um, Animals are subjected to brutal pain and suffering in the conditions they live through on many of these factory farms. And um, <clears throat> if we were going to respect the equal consideration of interest principle, we couldn't live uh, according to that status quo because we would care as much about their desire to avoid pain and suffering as we do in any other being that has the same exact desire or interest. Now, he makes one concession here. If you noticed as I was reading it, he says this. Well, that his argument does not quite establish ethical vegetarianism or veganism full stop. All that it establishes is that we should not cause the pain and suffering to the animals that they actually have an interest in avoiding. It's compatible with his argument to say that we could use animals as a means to a human end as long as they were not exposed to pain and suffering or as long as their interest in avoiding pain and suffering was respected. He's not arguing that they have a right to life uh, per se, 
because much like we've talked about in the abortion literature, animals may not have a fully fledged conception of what they uh, could lose if they stopped existing. So if they were painlessly euthanized, uh, then perhaps the animal uh, product used from them would be okay, as long as they also didn't suffer extensively before the moments of slaughter. So if we were willing to pay a premium to buy, like, say, more expensive, uh, humanely produced animal products that did not involve gratuitous suffering and pain on their part, then that would bypass the requirements of his moral position here, and that would, buy, that would be okay to him. Uh, so it's not so much the fact that they are being used as meat or the fact that they're being used as resources or that they're being slaughtered that is his major problem here. It's rather the fact that they suffer through pain, and that's something they have an interest in avoiding just like we do. So we should not be willing to cause them that uh, for more in trivial reasons than we would do in the case of a human. But some, after all, very uh, expensive boutique forms of, say, meat, eggs, milk, you can buy them at, like, boutique stores where you pay an inflated price, but you're paying that extra amount because you're paying for the animal's welfare. So when you get like bargain bin, you know, a dozen eggs or a big slab of meat uh, and you're getting it at the cheapest possible rate, you're not paying that additional cost to go with a smaller scale production operation, which is going to maybe afford the animals more space, more straw, better living conditions, more humane slaughter and so on. So if we could fully, you know, switch to like uh, these more humane alternatives for meat and dairy and stuff, then that would be okay to his argument. But... <clears throat> He makes a fair point where he says, even if that's something that could be done, the question is whether that's where the meat is actually coming from. And the vast majority of meat that's purchased by the consumer is just produced on factory farms because that's where the abundant supply of the cheapest meat is. Um, so, you know, again, there's a way of consuming meat that could be conscientious to animal pain and suffering, which would uh, fall within the parameters of what he thinks we have moral obligations to do and not do. But for the vast majority of all of us that are using meat products and animal products that don't come from those kind of more humane production methods, we would be subject to the critique of his argument that we should you know, boycott that behavior and stop because it's not uh, living by the equal consideration of interest principle. There's a way to live according to that principle, which makes use of animals but doesn't cause them suffering. But the typical uh, consumer of meat and animal products is not using those types of products and therefore are exposed to the you know, criticism of his argument. Okay, what about other things that are done to animals where we're species just against them in practice? Another area, not just using the animals as food, but let me list another one below it here. <clears throat> it's also using animals in um, animal experiments. <clears throat> Okay, so the two main ways that we, you know, at least are arguably, according to him, um, use animals in ways that are speciesist is by using them as food, which again ignores their interest in avoiding pain and suffering, sacrificing their major interests in that to our trivial interests and the pleasures of the palate that are not necessary. On the other hand, also using animals in experiments. So we do use animals in experiments um, as a society and culture, and um, some people would say, well, that's morally justifiable or excusable because it serves vital medical purposes, and maybe it relieves more suffering than it causes. <clears throat> so, you know, you might be thinking, well, if we test on animals and we cause these poor animals to suffer throughout their lives, you know, like in a medical facility, but we got back like some amazing medicines or um, innovative uh, drugs or surgical techniques or, you know, uh, whatever, um, or we learned enough about consumer products to prevent people from being harmed or killed, then that the animal, the sacrifice of the animal is worth it because it's paid out in terms of more total uh, happiness to the humans that benefit from the knowledge we derive from them. But you know what? Peter Singer, he just does not agree. His view about the uh, animals and experiments thing is that it just causes too much um, unnecessary pain and suffering to those animals. Um, now, why does he say that it causes too much pain and suffering, and that we don't get enough value back for the tests and the knowledge that we get from them themselves. Um, well, he points out examples of 
practices in the industry that are uh, very painful and harmful to the animals, but that deliver to us questionable or limited information or benefits. And he uses those as the sort of paradigm case of why animal experimentation is generally, in his view, immoral. So he kind of points out cases where there's a lot of pain and suffering the animals go through for our sake, but the knowledge that we get at the end of the day, it's not even that great, and it's not enough of a benefit to uh, compensate for the like harm done to the animals. So it's just a lot of pain and suffering for no clear or at least no significant benefit. Um, what's one of those tests? Okay, so here's a test that he mentions, which has that combination of factors. A lot of pain and suffering to the animals, but for questionable or limited benefits to humans. One of those is known as the Dreis test. Okay, so D-R-A-I-Z-E test. I don't know who this is named after. It must be some kind of scientist or biologist. But anyway, the Drace test is like this. So sometimes when we develop um, in like just consumer research uh, to bring a new product to the market, say it was like a shampoo or a food additive or some coloring or a preservative. If it's something with this type of chemical basis, sometimes before it is mass produced and put out on store shelves, they will run experiments on animals, test them on animals, to see if they have properties that are toxic to humans. Or, for example, if they could induce blindness, or if they were ingested, how sick they could make a human being. We want to be able to properly label these things so that we know we're not just giving people things that could, like, you know, kill them, or that could cause them permanent injuries, or diseases, or illnesses. So, for that reason, we will sometimes take, you know, um, a mammal life form that has a similar physiology to a human, and then we will introduce levels of this stuff to their body until it has an adverse effect. And that allows us to make reasonable approximations to how bad it would affect a human if it was the same. So in like one case, you take these little rabbits and you pour like just a pure concentration of shampoo into their eye until they go blind. And that is supposed to give you, I guess, labeling information about um, – you know, when the same shampoo that would be given to a human could cause that kind of harm. Now, isn't that pretty brutal, though? You know, using these animals, knowing full well that we're just going to subject them to, like, horrific pain and suffering. And what are we going to get at the end? Now, you might be saying, well, okay, I know it sucks to the rabbit or anybody that's getting that treatment. But think of all the little kids and other people and full-grown adults, whoever else, that it saves. Because now we properly have identified the features of this thing as it hits the market. But hold on. Singer's got you covered on that. He says, the thing is, though, these experiments that are being done today on these, like, consumer products, they're not being done on, like, the first ever shampoo or the first ever food coloring or preservative or whatever. They're being done on new varieties of these things so that, like, the company can just bring out, like, a new and improved formula of their already existing product line. But they already have dozens and dozens of these that have already been experimented on in the past. And we've already patented and learned what their properties were. So he wonders, what's the value of continuing tests in this area when we've already built all the products that we needed from existing tests that happened in the past? Let me read about it here, and this is what he says on page 583. He says, some people think that all animal experiments serve vital purposes, and they can be justified on the grounds that they relieve more suffering than that they cause. This comfortable belief is mistaken. Drug companies test new shampoos and cosmetics they're intending to market by dripping concentrated solutions of them into the eyes of rabbits, a test known as the Dreis test. Um, food additives, including artificial colorings and preservatives, are tested by what is known as the LD50. Here's another one, the LD50. Um, LD50, this is also very nasty. That means lethal dose 50%. So with LD50... You take this, um, you know, the chemical or product of interest, and you introduce it to a sample of animals, and you continue to introduce more of it until we get to what's known as a lethal dose for 50%, a level of consumption that will make 50% of the sample of animals die. In that process, nearly all of the animals are made very sick before some finally die and others pull through. Now, he points this out. These tests are not necessary to prevent human suffering. Even if there were no alternative to the use of animals to test the safety of these products, we already have enough shampoos and food colorings. So why develop new ones that might be dangerous? 
He's just saying if these tests are being done today, they cannot be justified on the basis that someone says we've never made shampoos and we just don't know what can happen when we make them or we've never made these food additives or colorings or preservatives and we just need to know what they do. We've already made all of those things in the past. So for a test to be done today, it would simply be on another variety of the same kind of product with a slightly different chemical composition. And um, that's not essential to protecting human health and safety. Why not just rely on the time tested and already approved uh, products that have come through these processes in the past? So, you know, using animals in experiments, again, a lot of pain and suffering to the animals, minimal or at least speculative benefits to humans derived as a byproduct of it. So again, he thinks it's only somebody that's not shown equal consideration of interest that can support this. Somebody who says, well, they don't want to suffer just like we don't, but I don't really care as much about their interest in that as I would if it was a human under the same circumstances. He also can, talks about brutal military experiments. I guess I should mention those just briefly. Um, for example, um, so at, at the... Um, at certain military um, facilities, we run experiments on animals to determine what effect some type of chemical or agent could have on a soldier if they were hit with it in a battlefield war. One of these tests is just so horrifying. Um, so they would get these monkeys that they would train to run in like a wheel. And the way they would train them to run for long times is that if the wheel stopped moving, then they would receive an electrical shock that was painful. So that would get them up into a frame of mind where they felt like I better keep running so I don't suffer the pain. So once we train them to run long distances in the wheel, uh, we'll then introduce them to like fatal doses of radiation. Oh my goodness. So now while they're sick and vomiting and barely able to keep moving, they try to run on this wheel and we do that until they collapse, fall over or die. And what's that supposed to tell us? That's supposed to tell us how far could a soldier theoretically continue to fight if they were hit by like chemical or nuclear weapons in the field of war after that happened, how far could they continue to function? And I mean, that's knowledge of a kind, but think about how much pain and suffering the animal suffers through for the sake of knowledge that may never necessarily be deployable in a real world context. After all, we would have to be in like either a nuclear or biological warfare context for that information to come in handy. And even then it would only be guidance as to how long a person could survive. So. Again, esoteric or of questionable value, the knowledge derived from such experiments in comparison to the massive pain and suffering of the animals. Um, you know, I'm tempted to think of even more contemporary example, which I was reading about in the news recently. So you may have heard of Elon Musk's other company, Neuralink, which is trying to find out ways to implant chips in human brains to restore, like, I don't know, vision to blind people or to do other kind of weird applications, like allow a person to remotely control through thought certain electronic applications in their environment, stuff like that. Just, Pretty futuristic, but to test it, he's had to work on monkeys. And uh, there's been some reporting coming out of the testing centers that this is just inhumane and brutal, and it could even be a violation of certain like uh, humane uh, treatment of animal laws. But yeah, drilling in these monkeys' brains, putting chips in, and trying to see if they can get this stuff to work. You know, the initial steps of the technology, it hasn't all been smooth sailing. So, um, and I've read some horrifying accounts of how traumatic and painful these monkeys' lives become before they have to then kill them. So anyway, um, look, we're going to hear both sides of the argument. I don't want you to think that there's only a one-sided view. We'll hear from Carl Cohen next lecture where he, he makes the argument that the animals don't have rights um, and they may be used in these experiments. In fact, he thinks that Singer and some of the people that follow Singer uh, exaggerate the harm. Well, not exaggerate the harms, but they minimize the benefits, rather, that such experiments can cause. Singer, to be fair, he does kind of hand-select some of the you know, examples of experiments that cause the most pain for the most questionable benefit. But you can select other examples where it seems like more plausible to say that a lot of lives or et cetera could have been saved through this other type of experiment on a different type of drug or, you know, medical advance or whatever. So, but anyway, that's just food for thought. He says, if you still think that these experiments are justified, it can't be because you don't think the animals suffer. It has to be because you think that their suffering doesn't have equal value to ours. And what could that be? Is it because they're not as intelligent as us? That's the most common answer that people give when they think about it for a minute. But he kind of tries to box you out and say, well, I mean, would you really think that that would be okay to do with a mentally disabled human? Obviously not. So it can't just be level of intelligence. It has to be some kind of arbitrariness. Like you just don't show equal treatment to beings that are not in the same species as you, even if in other similar ways they have similarities. Um, now, what about objections? Okay. 
So as we've learned, and as you should all know, um, there's always some uh, value to discussing objections to a given argument. An objection is a reason to find fault with someone's argument or to find some reason to disagree with its conclusion. So Peter Singer is famously just a very thorough uh, thinker, and he always tries to consider and contemplate what objections his critics might put off, put forward. So <clears throat> I'm just going to like <clears throat> talk to you about some of the objections that he mentions here at the end, and that's like the last part of our meeting for this lesson. <clears throat> so what are some objections to Peter Singer's view? Well, one of them is easy to dismiss. This one he just kind of knocks out of the park. Somebody might say, how do you really know they feel pain? Is that even obvious? How do we know they feel pain? Well, I'm sure that uh, I don't have to – convince you that animals could feel pain, but if, if we really need to make a case, let's go into it. Um, we know enough about the nervous system of a, of a mammal like ourselves and other life forms to understand what is responsible for generating pain signals in the brain. Um, so knowing that much and seeing the same kind of common central nervous system in other animals allows us to make pretty reasonable conclusions about the fact that they can suffer pain. And the other, even perhaps more obvious fact, as to how we know they suffer pain is because just look at their behavior. When they're exposed to a painful stimuli, they'll act the same way a human will. They'll scream out, they'll recoil, uh, they will writhe and uh, fight to get away from it. So we can only infer whether another being has pain based on the behavior because obviously you can't be that being feeling the pain that they're having. You just have to look at them, observe them, and see whether their behavior is consistent with feeling pain. So on two accounts, we know that they feel pain because their behavior is indicative of that, but also because we don't just have to look at behavior. We also know enough scientifically about the functioning of the nervous system. So, so much for that objection. How do we know they feel pain? He just kind of blows that out of the water. Here's another one. Um, this is sometimes known as the Ben Franklin objection. I'll just put it here so you can see that uh, as a reference to what I'm talking about. So the Ben Franklin objection. Okay, so this one's named after a, you know, uh, a classic figure in American um, history, that's Ben Franklin, whose face is on the you know $100 bill. Um, okay, so here's a story about him. I'm not sure if it's really true or if it's one of those tall tales uh, from American lore. But either way, the story goes that at one point in his life, um, he was a vegetarian, and so he didn't eat meat. He was at a friend's house for dinner, and his friend was cooking up a fish to eat. And when his friend uh, cut the fish open, he found inside the fish, right, he had to prepare the fish to cut it and, you know, serve it and everything. So he cuts open the big fish, but he notices inside of the big fish that there's a smaller fish inside the big fish's belly, okay? And according to this story, which to me honestly sounds kind of fictional, but anyway, the court, according to the story, Ben Franklin sees that, and he's like, okay, wait a minute. That fish has a small fish inside of him? I was a vegetarian, but never mind. I'm good. I'm gonna eat meat now because I'm seeing here that these animals are just eating each other. So if animals eat each other, why shouldn't we be able to eat them? If we do that, we're just doing the same thing they do. And so if it's fair for them to eat each other, then I think we should be able to eat them too. So that's the Ben Franklin objection. Animals eat each other, so why shouldn't we? That's basically it. Um, but Peter Singer has a reaction to that one too. He has a rebuttal and a reply. In a way, the response that he gives is simple. So first of all, animals that eat each other, they're not doing it out of preference. They're doing it out of necessity because those animals that eat each other in the nature, they literally cannot survive without, you know, preying on other animals and eating their flesh. But humans, it's not the same. It's not that we literally have to eat animals in order to survive. We are um, obligate carnivores, as they say, meaning that we can choose to eat meat or we could choose not to but we'll survive either way. So um, we can't say that we have the same essential need to eat other animals as animals have in respect of eating each other. Typical case of animals in nature is that they must eat each other in order to survive, and that's necessary for their survival. But in our case, we both don't have to eat them to survive, and many people don't eat them, and they do survive. Notice this also. I always think of this when I'm presenting this point. Um, human beings are not the most naturally carnivorous just from the standpoint of our physiological structure. When you look at um, natural carnivores in the wild that just basically don't even eat fruits and vegetables and they just eat meat all the time, like, like cats and stuff, um, they have talons, they have claws, they have sharp incisors. 
Um, same with like, I don't know, carnivorous, um, uh, other carnivorous animals in the wild, right? You're going to see a, a whole row of very sharp pointy teeth that are there to tear apart flesh and uh, talons and claws to like kill and subdue these animals that they're preying on. Um, but look at our mouth, you know, it's just a bunch of flat teeth. There's a couple of little incisors. Um, there's four of them basically in there. But it's not like uh, we're the most deadly looking creatures. We create tools and things that we then use to subdue parts of nature. But just looking at our hands and uh, our other physiological aspects, we don't have spines, we don't have talons, we don't have uh, you know, a mouthful of razor sharp teeth. So um, just from the standpoint of nature, it's not really this uh, obvious argument that many people make that, oh, you know, we're built to eat meat and that's just how we are as a life form. We're really just built as humans to have a rational choice as to whether we'd like to or not. And of course, most people do, but it's not essential that you do to survive. So again, his response back to this Ben Franklin objection, the animals just eat each other, so why shouldn't we, or why aren't we morally permitted to do the same thing they do? One point against that is that they can't survive without that, and we can. Another thing he says that's a bit odd about it is that it seems inconsistent in his view for the person to encourage us to imitate the behavior of animals when it suits the argument, but to emphasize how much different we are from the animals uh, when that suits the purposes of argument. Okay, so um, take the typical defender of the status quo. They'll say, well, here's why it's okay to eat animals, because they're just not like us. We're smart, they're dumb, we have language, we have technology, we have culture. They just don't have any of those things. So we're on a different level from them. That's why we're members of the moral community. They're not. So notice in this case, they're emphasizing the differences. But now we're hearing a guy saying, according to this objection, well, we're just like the animals. They eat each other. So we should just be the same as them, just be the same as these animals. But which one is it? Is it okay to eat the animals because we're different from them? That's one view. Or is it okay to eat these animals because we're all just animals and we're the same as them? It seems a bit inconsistent to lean so heavily on both emphasis of argument, but many people take it both ways. They'll say, you know, the difference between us and animals makes us special as members of the moral community. The similarities between us and animals gives us the right to eat them the same way they eat each other. Um, so that's another problem. And one more issue here that he says, as he, again, forms a counter to that, is that the animals, okay, they cannot reflect on their ethical choices. They cannot say, hmm, should I eat meat or not? They just naturally do it or don't do it. They can't weigh moral arguments on either side and come to a conclusion about what's right and wrong. But we can do that. And in fact, we absolutely are doing that right now, just as members of this class, reading these essays and listening to these lectures. So we maybe don't have the same kind of, I guess, blissful ignorance that the animals have as to the lack of awareness of all the moral complexities that they face or that we face, I guess. So there is his reaction to the Ben Franklin objection. And I can read from page 585 just a little bit more on that. And here's what it says. <clears throat> um, okay, so he says, for a start, most animals who kill for food would not be able to survive if they didn't, whereas we have no need to eat animal flesh. Next, it is odd that humans who normally think of the behavior of animals as beastly should, when it suits them, use an argument that implies that we ought to look to animals for moral guidance. But the most decisive point, however, is that non-human animals are not capable of considering the alternatives open to them or reflecting on the ethics of their diet. So it is not possible to hold the animals responsible for what they do or to judge that, they, that because of their killing they deserve to be treated in a similar way. But if you're reading this, on the other hand, you have to consider the justifiability of your dietary habits. You cannot avoid responsibility by imitating beings who are not capable of making moral choices. Okay, now <clears throat> what's another uh, objection to his view that he takes on and briefly considers? Another one has to do with stuff that we've kind of talked about earlier, so I'm just going to mention this briefly. Somebody might mention differences between us and the animals. They might say, well, we can use tools. They can't do that. Or we have language. And they don't have language. Um, or that we can make long-range plans and they can't do that. Um, but here's what he says on all these points, the so-called differences. So what are differences that might be between us? So someone might point to some of these differences as the reason that it's okay for us to not give equal consideration to their interests. Someone might say, well, we have tool use, which they lack. 
Someone might say, well, we have language, which they lack. Or someone might talk about long-range planning. Now, um, it's just another couple of factors that a person might point out in an effort to justify the status quo or, again, the unequal treatment of animal interests as compared to humans. But here's what Singer says to react to all those points. First of all, tool use. Okay, well, humans, to be fair, yeah, we do use pretty sophisticated tools. Right now you're using a computer or a smartphone, and same with me recording this lecture, and just, you know, the, the pens that I'm writing with, or the, I don't know, um, like, you know, there's garden tools, there's aviation tools, there's computers, there's all kinds of systems that humans manipulate um, at a high level of sophistication. So playing musical instruments, you know, um, deploying a tennis racket, you know, I mean, a golf club, so handling a rifle. So humans use tools, and uh, you might say, well, animals don't do that, so that's showing that they don't have the same moral status we have. But here's what he says back. Um, well, animals in some isolated instances also use tools. I mean, we've seen the greater apes sometimes will use um, uh, sticks and twigs to ferret out uh, termites that they use for food. Um, uh, beavers will work together cooperatively for a long time to build these big dams. Um, so at some maybe primordial level, maybe it's not the same degree of sophistication, of course, as ours, but we can see some type of tool use perhaps. Um, there have been a couple of cases of like elephants and other very intelligent animals that have been taught how to paint. You know, they give them a canvas and they allow them to use their tail or their nose. Um, what about language? Well, okay, they don't have the same kind of ability to formulate uh, full grammatical sentences that we have, but they often have very complex forms of uh, communication using sounds and signaling. Uh, there's the echolocation of marine life, some forms, aquatic mammals. Um, we've taught in some isolated cases great apes to speak sign language or to master a variety of American um, sign language signs. Um, Self-consciousness and planning, I don't know. Um, we plan for the future, yes, definitely. Um, you know, you're thinking ahead about maybe graduating and then getting a career and then, you know, later on retirement, marriage, children. We plan it all out. When we take a mortgage, we can understand it's a 30-year mortgage and we're going to be paying a certain percentage interest every month for the next 30 years. But um, you might say animals, they can't think ahead like that. They're just living in the moment. They're living for the time being, to eat, to sleep, to mate, and they don't think forward. But um, I don't know. In some at least extended sense, we see animals gathering nuts for the winter, hibernating, uh, sometimes migratory patterns that bring them back to the same place every year. Um, so is there some level of similarity between these things that animals, uh, they say, cannot do and ourselves? Perhaps, perhaps in some at least dim sense, animals have abilities that approach these. And even if they did not, though, he says, let's take it in another direction. Suppose that they don't have those abilities. How would that be relevant anyway to the main point, which is whether they can suffer? Again, he goes back to the Jeremy Bentham quote. The question is not, can they speak? Can they use a screwdriver? Can they plan a vacation? But the question is simply, can they suffer? And of course, to that question, the answer is yes, they can suffer. So even if they didn't have these other higher level abilities, why should that place our desire for veal on par with the calf's interest in having the ability to walk and uh, the ability to develop normally? So take the argument to its extreme that lacking these abilities takes you outside and places you outside the moral community so we can then just do whatever we want to you. Wouldn't that argument taken to its extreme mean that human beings that don't have these abilities, like say mentally disabled human beings, would also have the moral status of these inferior animals that are being talked about that could then be used for whatever purpose. That doesn't seem proper, he thinks. And he says, if you want to grant moral standing to the mentally disabled humans, you should see them as being in common with the moral status that he thinks we ought to extend to the non-human animals, because in some significant respects, they're similar, lacking in higher thought, reason, logic, language, but still capable of feeling pain and suffering and pleasure, so we should still respect their interest in avoiding that. And you think that's why we do show respect to a human person that's mentally disabled, but people don't necessarily show the same to the animals, and he thinks that's merely speciesism. Now, last point. Some people don't like this equation that he is making, this equivalence that he is drawing between the moral standing of the non-human animal and the moral standing of the mentally disabled human being. Some people think that... There has to be a reason to see a different status in the two, like a greater status for the mentally disabled human as compared against the, uh, the common or typical non-human animal. 
So, um, <clears throat> he gives two reasons that some people state to try and distinguish between those two cases of the mentally disabled human and the non-human animal. And again, why does he have to talk about that? Because um, he's dealing with a critic who says that there's no equivalence between the two. He tries to emphasize that equivalence so that we will extend the proper treatment that we give to mentally disabled humans to animals, to see them as in one common category means that we should lift up the uh, moral treatment of the animals to the current way that we do treat these not uh, these these mentally disabled human beings, uh, but he knows his opponent won't like that because they want to have it both ways. They want to say the mentally disabled human does have a higher moral standing than the animals, but now they're going to have to point out a morally relevant difference between the two, and it doesn't seem like it's going to be intelligence or cognitive ability. So what could be the morally relevant difference? Okay, so. So it just says there, um, difference between non-human animal and mentally disabled human. So what could it be? Okay, I'm going to type them over here so that I get that room that I need. So here's one of the differences. <clears throat> um, so somebody might say that the human, the mentally disabled human, it's still a member of a rational species, unlike the non-human animals. So there we go. So that's one of the supposed differences between the non-human animal and the mentally disabled human that his opponent might raise. He might say, okay, well, yes, the mentally disabled human and the animal can both have low intelligence and have low cognitive function and be similar in that way. But there's one difference you can point out. The mentally disabled human is still a member of a species that in normal cases has rationality, language, and higher thought. The animal, though, it's not like it is a deficient copy of a normally functioning member of its species, it's normal for say like the cow or the pig to not be able to use language or to not have higher reason or abstract thought. So the condition that's normal for that animal is abnormal for a human that's mentally disabled. So you can say that the mentally disabled human, we still bring them within the sphere of the moral community because they kind of get in based on their species membership. They're a member of a rational type of species after all, the word for our species is homo sapiens, which means the wise hominid. Uh, so built right into the description of what we are uh, at the level of the name of the classification is having reason. So if there's a mentally disabled human, suppose severely mentally uh, disabled, that in all relevant ways is similar in cognitive level to say a cow pig or whatever, um, you could argue that they're still members of the moral community with full strength uh, and they have, um, um, like we should give greater consideration to their interests than the like interests of comparative animals because although in all mental respects they bear similarities there's this difference in terms of the relational aspect the human's a member of a species that is rational as a whole where the animal's not that what does he say against this well he says it's a bad principle to live by because it sounds like you're saying we should treat the individual not on their individual merit but based on the qualities that they share with a group. So like, what if I said to you, I'm not gonna hire you for this job because I'm sorry to say you're perfectly qualified, but you know, you're a member of the, you know, the Smith family and uh, the Smith family going back generations, um, like your grandfather was a bank robber or something. You'd probably be like, hold on, that's not really fair because now I'm being judged based on something that is uh, derived from me being a member of a group. You're not judging me as an individual, but as a member of the Smith family and that's not right. But now this uh, difference here that's been stated is trying to imply that, well, if the mentally disabled person is themselves mentally deficient, we should still judge them based on the merit assigned to the group they're part of, which is overall rational. Um, 
But it's not okay to, like he thinks, judge an individual based on the group they're a part of. You actually judge the individual based on the individual. So um, even though this is an attempt to upgrade the way we judge the individual status, um, he doesn't think the principle that lies behind it is good because it says judge the individual based on group membership. So it would say, like, think of the mentally disabled humans as members of the moral community with full moral standing, um, you know, just because they're members of that group. But you're not supposed to judge individuals based on membership in a group. Keep in mind, though, he's not saying any of this because he doesn't want to respect the rights and moral status of the mentally disabled humans. He's just trying to say that it should be honored in the same way as the animals, so we should upgrade the treatment of those animals to the treatment of these humans, not in any way diminish or downgrade their treatment. But we'll talk about that, too, in just a second. We're reaching the end, so just a couple minutes left. A second uh, difference that is mentioned between the non-human animal and the mentally disabled uh, human is this one, number two. Um, so favoritism... Uh, for our own kind is right and necessary so that we treat each other properly. So the second point here says, um, it kind of almost gives up on making there be a difference. It says that, look, even if we can't establish how the two cases differ, it's fair and it's justified for us to play favorites for members of our own human race. Because if we didn't do that, if we didn't sort of see ourselves as somehow joined together in one common group that we regard with special importance, then that might lead to us dehumanizing and disrespecting each other. So in order to enforce this norm that human beings demand respect and that we should treat each other well, we almost ought to have a feeling of special partiality and favoritism for our own kind. Um, but again, he thinks that this distinction, his problem here is that it depends too much on the uh, feelings or emotions that a person has in terms of attachment to others, that that's what should determine their moral standing, um, how attached you are, or how, favorite, how much favoritism you show to them. But he says that's not a good principle to live by either because, um, you know, do some people care more about their pet dog or cat than their human neighbor? Yes. Are there plenty of people out there who, if there was a fire in their home and a fire in their neighbor's home and they could only save one of them, they would definitely save their pet instead of their human neighbor? There's a lot of people that are like that. And he thinks that that shows that um, if you just <clears throat> assign favoritism in order to enforce proper treatment, that embraces the principle that favoritism can be morally justified um, as a basis for who has more or less moral standing. But he doesn't think that's cor correct. Even to the opponent of animal rights, they should probably admit that the person who honors their pet's life over their human neighbor's life is getting their priorities out of order. Um, but according to this stated difference here between the non-human animal and the mentally disabled human, we should lean into that favoritism feeling as the right basis to guarantee proper treatment of each other. So he just doesn't see how irrational favoritism is something that's morally legitimate. Uh, the same kind of feeling could like, lead somebody to, I don't know, um, imbue more value in um, in a non-human person than a, than a uh, sorry a non-human animal than a human person. So um, the last point is this: he also supposes that his critic might say, well, if we don't make a big distinction between non-human animals and mentally disabled humans, that's going to put us on a slippery slope, and the slippery slope is going to end with us, um, you know downgrading the treatment of the mentally disabled humans. If we think that they're on par with animals, then maybe they will start being used for things like medical experiments or organ harvesting or whatever. And what a disgusting nightmare of a future that would be. But Singer says this person who argues about the slippery slope is getting his position and view wrong. He says um, his whole argument relies on this. To see an equality or a parity between the non-human animal and the mentally disabled human the reason he points that out is not to try and downgrade the treatment of the mentally disabled human to the level of current treatment of those non-human animals, but it's rather to what? Upgrade the treatment of the non-human animals to the current respect and recognition that we give to mentally disabled humans. So seeing them as similar is not intended with the goal of relegating them both to the margins of the moral community and not showing them any respect. Seeing them as similar is intended for a different purpose in his view, to make us aware that we're ignoring the moral character of our treatment towards these non-human animals, and we should show the same kind of uh, respect here as we already show to the mentally disabled humans. So, point I'll put here in the chat.
So just take me a minute to write this full statement, so just one second. I'm gonna get into the right number of characters, one second, sorry guys. Okay, there's part one of this. I'm going to write part two in just a second. So it says here, non-human animals being similar to disabled humans does not make a slippery slope toward downgrading the treatment of mentally disabled humans to the current treatment given to non-human animals. Instead, Okay, so let me read both statements and then we'll wrap this up here. It says, non-human animals being similar to disabled humans does not make a slippery slope toward downgrading the treatment of mentally disabled humans to the current treatment given to non-human animals. Instead, Singer's position that sees these two as similar, these two, is arguing for upgrading the treatment of animals to the current level of treatment and consideration that is given to disabled humans. So he says, seeing this equivalence should not make anybody think that let's just treat disabled humans like animals that we're tormenting and you know using for food and stuff on factory farms. Instead, he thinks we should stop engaging in the practices that subject those non-human animals to those terrible harms and abuses, at least in his view, because we should think of them as more similar than you'd perhaps considered to our non to, to sorry to our human disabled friends. Uh, who maybe don't have the same intellectual uh, aptitudes or capacities as the fully functioning and cognitively capable, but yet they can suffer and feel pain. And shouldn't that be the only thing that really matters in determinations of whether to give equal respect to their interests in avoiding pain and suffering? So I'll just read his last quote here, and then we'll wrap this one up. So it says, um, <clears throat> the slippery slope argument uh, let me go back a bit. It's on page 588. So he says, in the present context, the argument is used to suggest that we need a clear line to divide those beings we can experiment, uh, experiment on or fatten for dinner from those we cannot. Species membership makes a nice sharp dividing line, whereas levels of consciousness, autonomy, or sentience don't. 
Once we allow that an intellectually disabled human being has no higher moral status than an animal, some argue that we have begun a descent down a slope, the next level of which is denying rights to social misfits and the bottom of which is a totalitarian government disposing of any groups it doesn't like by classifying them as subhuman. The slippery slope argument may serve as a valuable warning in some cases, but it cannot bear too much weight. If we believe that, as I have argued in this chapter, the special status we now give to humans allows us to ignore the interests of billions of sentient creatures, we should not be deterred from trying to rectify this situation by the mere possibility that the principles on which we base this attempt will be misused by evil rulers for their own ends. The change I have suggested might make no difference to our treatment of humans, or it might even improve it. He says, it is important uh, to remember that the aim of my argument is to elevate the status of animals, not to lower the status of any human. I do not wish to suggest that intellectually disabled humans should be force fed with food colorings until half of them die, although this would certainly give us a more accurate indication of whether the substance was safe for humans than testing it on rabbits or dogs. I would like our conviction that it would be wrong to treat intellectually disabled humans in this way, to be transferred to non-human animals at similar levels of self-consciousness and with similar capacities for suffering. It is excessively pessimistic to refrain from trying to alter our attitudes on the grounds that we might start treating intellectually disabled humans with the same lack of concern we now have for animals, rather than give animals the greater concern that we now have for intellectually disabled humans. Okay, so that's how he ends his article as a last word. Um, but now I guess we've covered one more piece. So when we come back next time, we'll start to look at the other side of this whole uh, debate and moral argument. We'll see what those that say uh, animals don't have moral status or that the status quo in which we use them for our purposes is morally justified. And we'll now be able to compare the different views against each other. So uh, I know this one's gone a little longer, but Singer has a lot of interesting information to sort through. I hope that you've been able to find some interest in it. And uh, anyways, I'll be in touch with you soon with more lectures and with more course content that I'll be posting to our Canvas page. So for now, take it easy. Thank you so much. And I'm signing off again. So have a good one and I'll talk to you soon.